All right. I want to talk to you about your Heavenly Father. Uh, all, all month, we've been looking at the fact that Christmas is a celebration of this amazing gift who is Jesus. And it is a celebration of, of, of God sending His Son into the earth. But we've been focusing not so much on the gift as we have on the giver. What does Jesus coming to earth tell us about the heart of the Father? I, I have been told before, I have heard many times... Uh, that what you believe about God may be the single most important thing you have. It will shape what you think about people. It will shape what you think about truth. It will shape what you think about morality. It will shape all sorts of other pieces. And it, it sits as this sort of central reality that can shape your whole life. And so we want to look at closely at who is the Father that He would send His Son at Christmas. Who is God that we might worship Him? <coughs> So all month we've been looking at what the nativity has to tell us about God. All right, so a few years back, I'm driving along, and uh, there was a billboard. <coughs> Big sign on the side of the road, solid black with white words that said, Don't make me come down there. <laughs> Dash God. And I laughed, right? I laughed. A couple of you chuckled, right? It kind of has that, that, you know, mom or dad are upstairs and they hear the kids making noise and they're, you know, shouting down the staircase, don't make me come down there. And I, and I kind of chuckled. And then I stopped and I realized, A, he did come down there. And B, he wasn't grumpy about it. Right? Everything about the tone of don't make me come down there. It's a threat, it's, it's upset, it's grumpy. And yet as we get to Christmas, as we look at the nativity, the reality is he did come down here. But with none of the emotion that was in that billboard. It's a different set of emotions. God does feel, part of the fact that we are made in his image is that we also, our feels are a reflection of the fact that God is a God of emotion. He has feelings, and so do we. And what are the feelings and emotions that he brought to the nativity? It wasn't anger. It wasn't, you foolish kids are interrupting me, and now I've got to come discipline you, and I don't even like doing this, and this, it's none of that. What do you think of God the Father? Christmas is the celebration that God did come down here. And we didn't make him do it. And we wouldn't have wanted to avoid it. The more, the more I think about the billboard, the more I think it is actually just completely wrong. I still laugh at it. But then my sense of humor is a little like that. We wouldn't want to avoid it. Everything about him coming down here was good and for our benefit because he loves us. It's fitting that one of these four candles would focus on the word love because Christmas is about that very thing. God looked at us, looked at humanity, and like a father looks at his children beaming with pride because he loves them so much and he's so proud of all that they, that they can be, it was a moment of excitement that prompted Christmas. Let's look at a few passages this morning. I've got several. I don't even know if I'll get to all of them, Caleb, but thanks for doing slides this morning. Uh, we're going to go to Luke 2. starting at verse 8. In the same region, the region of Bethlehem where the nativity is going down, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good news 
right? The opposite of that billboard. God comes down in the, in the attitude of that billboard. It's not good news. Now, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is, is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a feed trough. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. We read this passage every Christmas, uh, and maybe other times during the year as well, but certainly every Christmas we're going to read this passage, right? And every time, I don't know if you've ever been, you've seen little kids do a Christmas play, right? They're going to put the, the, the tea towel on their head with a little piece of cloth, and they're going to have a stick, and we're going to have shepherds, and they're going to show up. And the shepherds are such a key part of what the nativity looks like in our mind's eye. But this phrase that the angels end with tells us about the Father. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. I don't know if you've had an opportunity for your dad to look at you and say, I'm so proud. I'm so proud of you. I don't know if you've had an opportunity for your own father to look at you and say, I am so glad you're here. I would like to spend more time with you. I don't know if you've had a time where your own father could communicate pleasure at your existence. And I recognize in our broken world that for many people, eh, maybe you've not encountered that. And it's very tempting to think that our own struggles in life are reflection, reflections of the Almighty. A lot of times we reflect our own earthly experiences back on God and think God's like the people I've met. I see people who do that all the time in the church. Somebody in the church is rude to them, and they assume God is rude. Somebody in the church is judgmental, and they assume that God is judgmental. And the reality is, is that God is not a man. He is the Almighty. And as he looked on the earth, he didn't go, well, I guess I'm going to have to squish all those ants. He looked at the earth and said, these are my people created in my image. I love them, and I'm going to send my son. And he went in love and in hope that first Christmas. God has a lot of hope for you. Probably he has more hope for you than you have for you some days. In fact, I'm almost certain he has more hope for you than you have some days. <laughs> because he sees the possibility of who you are. He knits you together in your mother's womb. He knew you before you were born. And there was hope and there was purpose in your existence. Because he knows you, young lady. God knows you. And he loves you. And he's beaming with pride that you're his child. Do you have issues? Of course. Should you work on them? Yes. Does it affect whether or not God loves you? No. No, really, work on your issues. I'm not kidding about that. That's, that's a valuable part of growing up, right? But it's not what motivated the nativity. It was motivated out of love. We see this reflected not only as Jesus is arriving, as the proclamation to the shepherds, but also as Jesus stands up in ministry. So if we go over to Luke chapter 4, Jesus has just been tested in the desert. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He goes to his hometown of Nazareth. He's in the synagogue. Oops, sorry. I'm on the wrong, on the wrong page. There it is. And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and they hand him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he unrolls the scroll and founds the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I want to talk to you about God's favor and how God's favor is reflected in Christmas. God's favor is what motivates this whole thing. He's not motivated... He's not motivated in anger to send His Son. He's motivated in hope. He's not motivated in wrath. He's motivated in love. He is motivated out of his favor. And Jesus shows up and says, I've got good news for the poor. I've got good news for the blind. I've got good news for those in prison. Everybody gets good news because I've come to bring the Lord's favor. And it doesn't negate the fact that some people are bound up in chains, whether prison kind of chains or your own kind of just brokenness in your life kind of chains. And so there's, there's a proclamation of freedom to those who are bound and sight for those who are blind. I don't know how many of y'all have, have noticed your own blindness before. Uh, it sneaks up on me sometimes, probably because I'm blind and can't see it coming. But he proclaims sight for me. And he proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. I went looking uh, on the internet to find who's got a good definition of the word favor as it's used here. What, what does the Lord's favor mean? And, and, I, and I found, um, uh, I found a, a, a black pastor's sermon that was excellent. Excellent sermon. And he kept calling it God's demonstrated delight. And I thought it encapsulated it really well. I, just, I, mean, I, li I liked his wording that God's proclaimed the year of God's demonstrated delight. Because he is a proud papa who looks upon his creation with hope and with love and consistently works for our good. If you're blind, should you receive sight from Jesus? Yes. If you're bound, should you receive freedom? Yes. <clears throat> but are those conditions for God's love for you? Nope. Father sent his son because he delights in humans. He delights in us as sons and daughters. I, I still remember the day that Romans 5, this is verses 6 through 8, um, where God convinced me of the truth of this. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For we'll scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That logic plays out every Christmas. That while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to be born into this earth for our salvation, for our good. He, he didn't wait till we got it all figured out. It, he didn't just sit back there and tap his toe hoping that we'd get it right somehow. He, he very proactively sent his son to us. And because of that, we get what the passage that's in Romans 8 as well, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. It's an interesting thing that happens. At Christmas, we, we discover that Father is a really good name for God. Because He sent His Son. And we begin to see this relationship 
that is familial, that is loving, that, that is in, in, brings the hug around us and says, come be part of my family. And there's, there's this, this just proud papa that's kind of in the middle of the story who invites us not to become slaves and to just follow the law like a harsh taskmaster and invites us to become children made in his image and redeemed to be his children. It invites us in. A few years back, we started de decorating our house with um, some nativity sets, and um, we accidentally let that be known that we were doing that, and then we got more. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had that happen in, in your house. So we have several of them now, and, and some of them are on display, and some of them are still in boxes because we don't know where to put them. But we, we have these nativity sets, and... If you set up your nativity properly, right, Jesus is at the middle of it, right? You put Jesus, little baby Jesus in the middle, and then Mary and Joseph left and right, and then the shepherds are a little further out, wise men a little further out. Some of you don't bring the wise men out until January. Where's my people? Nobody? You know what I'm talking about. Okay. Right, like you kind of you set it up. There's this look to it. You've been made children. Sons and daughters of God, co-heirs with Christ. As you set up your nativity, where did Jesus' brothers and sisters go? Let me rephrase that. Where do you belong in that story? You sons and daughters of God, co-heirs with Christ. You should be right there in the middle of it. That's where we belong. God didn't send his son to squish us, to punish us. He sent his son to save us. Frankly, we needed it. Like so, like I'm not, not negating that. Frankly, we needed it. But he sent his son for our good. It, it is very much the opposite of don't make me come down there. It is very much the opposite. We see God's favor throughout Scripture, and it's for us. And we see it at, at times just in unlikely places. I was looking at, at, at God's favor, and I was doing this, this you know, doing the, the Scripture search. The Internet's so amazing. You can type in a search string, and you can go find things. It's so much faster than when I had to, like, look it up in Strong's Concordance and then go look passage by passage. so much faster. But I was looking, and I saw a glimpse of it in such an unlikely place that I felt like it was like the Old Testament version of what the angels are saying to the shepherds. In Exodus chapter 34, this is right after the golden calf, train wreck of a moment for the people of Israel. Moses goes back up on the mountain and Moses quickly bows his head to the earth and worships and he says, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord. Please let the Lord go in the midst of us. For it's a stiff-necked people. I resonate with that. My children don't get their stubbornness from their mom. Pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. It is the same language. Peace on earth, glory to God in the highest and among people with whom he is pleased. Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. If I've found favor with you, God, would you go among us? Is what we catch in Isaiah, in, in, um, from Moses in Exodus 34. If we found favor, would you go among us? And what we see in Jesus is this is the, year's, the year of the Lord's favor, and then he walks among us. Church, the Father is for you. If there are sins to forgive, he wants to. Because he sent his son to save you from your sins. If there are failures to repent, repent of them. And then come into the Lord's embrace. 
Christmas is a time of invitation. Come. Come closer. When you set up your nativity, we, we, we set people up sort of an increasing distance, and, and we stand back and we look at it, and the reality is, is the invitation of Christmas is come close. Because the Father wants you to be His child. Wants to wrap you up in His arms. A couple of things as you're... <clears throat> couple of thoughts for you to consider, just an application. I, I don't know what your own uh, parenting has been like. I don't, I don't know how your father has fathered you. I hope it's gone well. I recognize the challenges. Do you let God father you? Do you let him correct you when you need corrected? and encourage you when you need encouraged, and lift you up and welcome you and support you? And do you let him give you that identity as beloved child? Do you let God father you? Because we need him to support our identity and say, you are named, you belong. We're not illegitimate children. You are named and you belong. You are children, sons and daughters, co-heirs. Do you let him father you? Both to receive his blessing and his favor, but also to follow in his guidance, to obey him. Do you let him father you? And if as I'm asking that question, you're like, yeah, no, not always, sometimes, you're feeling the tension of it, then would you receive God's invitation to receive that today? Because he's, he's your heavenly father. He's your proud papa. Will you let him give you your strength of being? Will you receive from him as a child? It is such a strength when you face the challenges of life, the hard times of life, to know that your Heavenly Father has your back. A bunch of people have figured out how to take pictures of a little little lion cub with a big daddy lion behind him, right? And the little lion cub looks much, much bigger with the big daddy lion standing behind him. I don't know if you've seen a photo like this. There is a gajillion on the internet. You can go find one later. Uh, but it's the same imagery that, that in my childhood when I watched The Lion King for the first time and little Simba gives off his little squeaky baby cub roar and it comes out as Mufasa's roar. This Christmas, I just invite you to receive that strength from your Father. Because as children, that's who we are.